Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you for coming along to, to today's meeting of the <coughs> Planning Applications Committee. If we can move straight on to the agenda, item number one is the evacuation procedure. We, we've not been told of any um, <coughs> planned alarms to go off, so if they do go off we'll treat them for real. If we can vacate the chamber by the doors either side of the chamber, down the, the steps, out the front door, meet across the road at the Yorkshire Bank. If anybody does need any assistance, give us a shout, we'll make sure that assistance is given. It's also um, a good time to remind people to put your phones on silent or, <coughs> to, or uh, vibrate, just so they're not going to go off. Mine usually does after I've said that. And uh, also just to advise people that our meetings are recorded and go out via the Council's website at a later date, well, normally within the next few days. <coughs> item, number <coughs> item number two, to receive apologies for absence. None? Okay. Is that Councillor Copeland? Councillor Pomfret is going to be late, yeah. Okay, thank you. Item three is to confirm the minutes of the meeting, which was on the 30th of January. They have been circulated. You happy to assign those? Yes. Agreed. And item four, of, uh, uh, to receive any declarations of disclosable pecuniary and other interests in accordance with the Member's Code of Conduct, other than those that are already printed on the, the paper or when it, if anything becomes apparent at the time. No? Okay, thank you. Item number five, the declarations of contact. If I can say in regards to item number three... I think probably all members have been contacted by the applicant, yeah? yeah. And uh, I also was copied into an email from Councillor Condacor and I believe there's a summary of what he had to say on the addendum. <coughs> yeah. Councillor Wilson. To the Abbey Street one about McCarthy and Stone, I was contacted by a resident of Whitestone in my patch expressing that they were in favour of the development and asked me to note their uh, particular views. I did mention that I'm on the planning committee and therefore gave no indication as to how I intend to vote. Okay, thank you. No. Okay, that takes us on to items number six. Planning applications where people have indicated a wish to, to speak. If I run through that process... Um, the officers will present the report. Uh, following on from that, we'll take the names of the people that are listed in front of us. haven't been given any extra. Um, you'll get three minutes to make your uh, representations. When the egg timer goes off, I'll stop you. That's just so that we're fair to everybody, so that you get the three minutes each. Um, However, members of the committee may ask for points of clarification, but only from what you've said within your presentation. <coughs> uh, following on from that, the officers may or may not want to uh, add anything in, and then we'll need something moved and seconded so that we can debate the matter. Um, normally, a decision is made on the day, on some occasions, we do defer items for further information or for site visits, things like that. But normally, we make our decisions 
on the day. Okay, so if we can go on to item number one then, which is the land at Parks Farm Bedworth, well, Exhall Bedworth. Item one is for the erection of 92 dwellings and is an approval of reserved matters relating to appearance, landscaping, layout, scale of an already approved outline application at Parks Farm. This is a small holding bounded by the embankment of the A444 to the west and the river south to the south and east. Across the river is the modern residential development of Silt Weaver's Way and the older properties of Daffan Road, Jones Road, Bentley Road, Rectory Drive and Armton Road. The former rugby football club is to the north. The principle for residential development is established by the outline approval. This application has been reported to Planning Applications Committee as members requested that the reserve matters were brought back to committee when the outline application was approved. The area outlined in purple, just down there, is not currently being considered and will be applied for at a later date. There have been two letters of objection from two neighbours citing concerns on highway safety issues and flooding. The elements for consideration on this application, as I say, are siting, design, appearance, landscaping and ecology. In relation to the siting, it is an isolated from other existing residential development and therefore has no undue impact on existing properties and also fully complies with the distance standards of the residential design guide within the proposed development. The proposal fully complies with the 25% affordable policy and provides 23 affordable dwellings which are split between 14 social rented houses, which are the ones outlined in pink, not particularly brilliant to see on here, sorry, um, and nine shared ownership, which are the ones outlined in blue. Twelve of the units are two bedroom at the request of housing. Part of the site is within the floodplain of the River Sam. None of the houses have been located within the functional flood floodplain or indeed within Flood Zone 2, which is flooding in 1 to 100 to 1 to 1,000. The Flood Zone 2 is shown by the blue line there. Areas for storage, flooding and attenuation have been provided within the site within the areas of public open space. Neither the Environment <coughs> Agency nor the County Flood Risk Management Team have objections to the proposed layout subject to the conditions. The Boroughs Parks team have objected to the layout on three issues which are the lack of the new public, lack of new public footpaths serving the new open space. The open space is there. This can be overcome by, via condition of the provision of a tarmac path. Their second concern is that some of the new dwellings backing onto the existing footpath that connects Smarts Road with Re Rectory Drive, which is the north of the site, footpath is along there. The reasoning behind the concerns is that parks have experience of having to clear up garden rubbish from paths at the back of houses. However, it is considered by planning officers that as the path is relatively open and busy, that is not likely to be abused in this way. Their third concern is the potential impact to the row of trees, shrubs, that separates the site from this footpath. So again, you can just see some of the outlines there. It is considered that this objection could not be sustained at appeal, as the master plan for the outline shows the houses located in this area, and that these objections should have been raised during the outline application, not during the reserve matters. In addition, the trees, shrubs, are outside of the site, and not considered worthy of a tree preservation order. However, protection during construction can be achieved via condition, and, and in addition, the building control legislation will require that the tree roots are protected during excavation. The design is in keeping with the area and has a mix of house types with two and two and a half storey houses. The landscaping is considered to be acceptable with some changes to the planting mix that can be dealt via a condition. Warwickshire Wildlife Trust 
required updated ecological surveys, but officers considered that as the outline was still live at the time of the reserve matters submission, that this was an onerous requirement, and in any case, the treatment of any protected species is covered under separate legislation and directives. The proposal also provides bird nesting boxes and bat bricks due to the proximity of the, of the wildlife corridors of the river and the hedgerow. In conclusion, it is considered that siting, design, external appearance, <coughs> landscaping and ecology are acceptable or can be made so via condition. And it is recommended that the application is approved subject to the conditions as printed in the agenda and the addendum. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Adam Holmes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Adam Holmes and I'm from Tenewimpi and speaking in support of this scheme. We fully support the recommendations as set out in the officer's report. Um, the reserve matters application before us today follows the grant of outline plan admission uh, on the 9th of April 2014 the grant of the erection for up to 92 houses. As confirmed within the officer's report, the principle of residential development at the site and its access is already established. Therefore, this application only seeks the approval of appearance, scale, layout and landscaping. With regard to appearance, it is proposed that all dwellings will utilise materials found in the local area, such as brick render. The bricks are generally red, with either blue or buff bricks are used as contrast, and the roof tiles proposed are either grey, brown or red. A variety of hard and soft boundaries are utilised to provide an attractive separation between public and private spaces. In terms of scale, the proposed dwellings are two-storey in height, with the exception of a number of two-and-a-half-storey dwellings in key locations, which will provide focal points and legibility and wayfinding. The design approach and overall density <coughs> reflects the mix of the properties surrounding the site. As, as seen from the accompanying plans, the proposed layout ensures that there is no undue impact on the residential amenity of any of the surrounding properties or uh, between future occupiers within the site. All the properties are cited uh, to comply with the distance standards in the residential design guide and 25% of the site contains affordable properties, all of which will be tenure lined. Finally, landscaping at the site takes into consideration the potential for protected species, the river corridor and the existing trees and landscaping on the site periphery. A large central open space uh, is provided and amendments have been made to take into account of the parks and countryside comments, including through the provision of bird and bat boxes we concur with the officer's conclusions that the landscape approach is acceptable. In summary, we agree with the officer's assessment of proposals which will result in the sustainable development of an allocated housing site. As such, we fully support the recommendation for approval. Thank you. OK, thank you. Okay. Councillor Copeland. Uh, appearance, and that sort of thing, uh, I think it, that seems like can include it the design of the, the actual uh, buildings themselves, the houses. Now, on page 23, 24, 25, we we'll have drawings of them that are, well, very unimaginative, shall we say. And up on the screen, we have houses that bear no resemblance to the ones. So, which ones are correct? Uh, they're the CGI's of what we're proposing. So the drawings that I have in front of me, page 23, 24, 25, of the particular concern uh, about 23 Kentdale, the real elevation has no windows. Is that correct? Uh, that, that is correct because it's a corner plot, so it's got windows at the side, uh, at, at both sides of the property and at the front. Okay, but just to clarify that, yeah. if I can through you. When and if built, they would look like this and nothing like the... Yeah, that, that's what they'll look at, is, is the, they'll look at the elevations on there. I know when it's on a, a big bit of paper and it's black and white, then they don't look very good at all, but it is what, what will be on there. Well, Chair, if I could just come back, it gives the, impre the, 
the gentleman is giving the impression they're the same, but they're in fact not. So I need to know, I need to be clear, although he is saying it's the same as here, but now he's yeah. talking as if these drawings are correct. Because by golly, I hope these drawings are not correct. Can, can I, yeah, he's points of clarification to the yeah, person yeah, that well, spoke. Uh, I mean, I'll bring the officer in when we've gone past the clarification. There's nothing else to add. It, it's the point, it's the ones that are on the, the screen. <coughs> okay. Okay, um, I've got a, something I'd like to clarify as well. It, it's on a similar thing, it's about uh, design and appearance. You mentioned that there would be some two and a half storey buildings. Again, I can't see any of those in front of me or on the screen. Um, do I assume by that that you mean Velux windows in a roof space? Uh, yes. Yeah, so they're two storey but with a Velux window in the roof. Okay. You have also said that they would be um, comparable to other local things. I can't, well, I'll, no, I'll leave that, that's for the, the debate. Um, but you're saying there are, but we haven't got any, draw, any drawings that show these two and a half. I think originally that there are some identified on layout, on the layout, just as key locations. Well, uh, okay. Any other points of clarification? No? In that case, to enable debate to take place, can I move the recommendation? Is that so? Any member? Councillor Tony Lloyd. Councillor Copeland was asking a question that I've been sitting here pondering uh, of design. We've got a planning application in, in front of us, uh, and we have to take it on what's here, are two totally different. We've got plans here, and we've got drawings up there, and we've got to make a decision, one saying that's there, them up there, one saying that ain't down there, and we've got to make a decision. I was going to comment, because that there, looking at them, are the ones like the flowers, so smaller rain, turn right, and that. If you look at them, they're virtually the same type of development over the road over there. The one thing I'll be down the bottom where they wanted to build, if you look to the right or go to the trouble four halfway along there, there is an estate built in, I call it the white estate, the small where the houses are white, uh, uh, building with wooden in there. And they are uh, <coughs> really designed. We always spoke about getting something different designed instead of being good old British square. We've got the square stuff again. Well, you go down there, I'm always sure that the contractors look to go and have a look at that because they have designed the buildings down there in modern. To me, a lot more modern, different type of shapes of housing there. So it really is a nice little estate, and people do like to enjoy living on there. And if you drive past down there, right, and look to the void, have a look when you go by, you might know this would come up. Just have a look if you go by, have it, because it's an estate that you say, well, wow, that's nice. And if contractors would start looking and doing instead of keep building something that's square and dumb, and that's all we're getting, everywhere they've been, that's all you get. Cheap, trying to get them to save money, keeping their money in the bank, and look at it. But to me, today, you're asking me to, to vote on two different things. What's in front of me, what's up there, and they're all different. Everything's different. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I think this ought to go back and defer and put in a report together to marry up the design and what's up there and what is stated in there. I agree the officers can tell us, they'll explain to us and that, but it's still here, it's a document that's being presented to us and it ain't the same. And you want us to vote on what is in front of us on its merits and they are different. So, sorry. Uh, I won't be voting according to that because the difference. I would like to move these are deferred and the document put together that is all the same so we can then make a correct and proper decision because the people down there won't please us because once you put 92 houses down by the rubber down there, wow, it is going to be one hell of an area down there, I can assure you. So let's get it right, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Claire, say is <coughs> probably they're the same. The drawings are probably the same on there, but these are flat where they're kind of three D, exactly which, which are up there. Yeah. But if you can cover that and Councillor Copeland's point that yeah. he raised okay. in there, because we haven't, we've got lots of house types for this particular site. We haven't put all of them in the agenda. The ones that are in the agenda are only a selection of some of the house types because there's so many it would probably double the size of the agenda so we haven't put all of the house types this is just a selection and in relation to whether they're different or not we haven't put the cgi 3d version in the agenda because they're colored and when you print them in black and white they just come up as a big black blob they don't look right in the agenda so we've put the flat elevation drawings which give the relevant detail of all of the elevations in the agenda. And for the presentation purposes, because we've got colour and you can see them better on the big screens, we've used those. They are exactly the same house types. There is no difference between them. It's just that some are in colour and easier to see on the big screen and some are in black and white and easier to see on an agenda. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Councillor Copeland. Oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Wilson. And the points about design and, and everything, um, and I'm willing to accept um, Claire's explanation. Looking at the ones on, on the screen that are presented in front of us, they look no better or any worse than any of the other applications we've approved in St Nicholas, Weddington, wherever. My main concern, and why I went back to go look at the, the bigger map chair, is the top left-hand corner of the map, it appears, barring the little smidge in the top right, that all the social housing and affordable housing is being put on that kind of like L-shaped development in the top left-hand corner, according to um, the big map. And that concerns me because we've had a long-standing policy of pepper potting social housing around the borough, and the fact that we are putting the social housing closest to the A treble four, that concerns me greatly, <coughs> Chair, about being equal and fair to all types of tenure across the types of housing we have in the borough. At the moment, that's minding me to refuse it, unless I hear other points in debate or the officers can assuage my concerns on that front, but I believe that we have a policy of pepper potting for a reason, and that as far as possible, and I've sat here in committee when we've rejected them. I think we did them over on the Arbury Estate, the Feather Estate, where we refused it a couple of times because of not pepper-potting them. Um, and I don't see why we should diverge from our established policy on this one. But I might have been willing to go with it if there'd been a nice view, but the fact that you're going to be looking over on the a treble for cars going backwards and forwards 70, 80 miles per hour, that, that's what's potentially tipping me over the edge to refuse it, Chair. In relation to the affordable housing spread, yes, there is a group in the top left corner, but there's also a group in the top right hand corner, and there's also another grouping overlooking public open space. Because it's only 92 dwellings, it's not a particularly large site, and on that basis, pepper potting isn't really going to create much by way of separation of the properties. So we've consulted with housing, and housing are happy with the layout as shown on the, on the plans here. In relation to the impact on the A444 and the view that those people will have, the A444 is actually raised at that point. Um, so they will be looking at a green embankment. They won't be looking at the A444 and the cars going past. It will be a green embankment. And as part of the original outline application, there were conditions that were added to say that they have to supply us with noise attenuation barriers to prevent too much noise reaching this site. That will be dealt with under the original outline permission, which is why there's nothing on this, because there's a condition already in place. So the view is of a green area, um, and the um, affordable housing is actually spread throughout the site in one, two, three, four groups. Odd ones dotted, but the vast majority yes. are in that top left hand corner. That's what concerns me. Okay. I'm thinking of the last speaker as well on the affordable housing. 
I'm in agreement for that. That just concerned me a little bit. But I'd be going to go back to this design and what's up there, if we could go back to what was on screen, the visual of the house. Because I accept what's being said, but I've accepted it to a degree, shall we say. Yeah. In other words, the house on the right, what is the name of that uh, design? Because it's all very well saying there's a mix of that, but what is the majority of them or whatever? What I don't want is in the future me going down there, having a look or whatever, and 90% are like the paper, not that. So I've still got a concern. Uh, and tying in, if you like, with the affordable housing, are the ones on paper, the Kent Dale, the Mitford, Mitford um, Canford, are they the affordable type? The memory that um, the Canford and Kentdale and Midford are the ones that are private uh, market properties, and the one that you can see, which is the last one on page 25 of your agenda, is one of the affordable house types. And the ones up on the top there, so this, the two on the right. What? the name of these and how many are those I would there? need to check back through um, the name of that specific one but just having a quick count up of the number of house types there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, about 17 different house types spread through the 92 dwellings so there is a, a good mix on this site, they're not all one particular house type. Okay, so uh, I just find it. Uh, I mean, uh, right, I'm not convinced actually with the, the explanation about what, because we've had drawings in front of us that are better than this. So I don't really take on board the explanation that some type of houses can't be too unpayable. I mean, you've got breaks in the roof spaces there with things I don't know what you call them. But none of them appear here. These just look inferior design, and I'm just fearful that there'll be too many of these, if you like, on the estate. I assume that these pictures in the report are the ones that we've got on the computer, and that's basically what you get. That's the block bog standard one, and they just they've just printed up um, <coughs> as per uh, or amended as per the developers it's probably me being sick so you have to pardon me but do you have to ha have a helicopter to live on this estate because I can't find on my plans or in the report or on that big plan how you actually get into it and all the roads on the plans end in a hammerhead so I can't figure out where the actual access to the estate is going to be. Um, so hopefully somebody can enlighten me, because the only way to get in that at the moment is to fly in. Where the hand is, the screen in front of you. Where? That's the main access into the site. So if you know Smarts Road, you go down Smarts Road, underneath the bridge over the bypass, yeah. then you go back up a hill again, you yeah. turn left into the former rugby club, and right into this site. Well, that's a track, isn't it? No. no. No, it's right at the end of the highway. It's been a few years since I went down there. Let's stop it now. Right, let's not confuse things up. I think the track you're talking about is the footpath where they were talking about the uh, trees and hedgerows. Um, Councillor Pomfret, did you? I saw somebody. Oh, Councillor Tony Lloyd, uh, Ian Lloyd. Um, I'm going to ask the same question as I asked last time again, um, and that is on the bridge. Uh, I am aware, because it dips down there, um, there is excessive flooding uh, within that area. What is going to be done uh, to remedy that? And um, what is going to be done to control the amount of traffic coming down Smarts Road? No, you're going to get oh, and the final <laughs> one is County Highways have agreed the layout. To the flooding that you mentioned, that was dealt with as part of the outline application and from memory um, the 
The problem stems from the fact that some of the drain gullies have been covered up by tarmac as they've resurfaced the road. Um, it's been raised with the county right back when the outline application was considered and there are conditions in the planning decision notice for the outline application to ensure that those are exposed and that the flooding situation is alleviated. In relation to the number of cars that are going down Smarts Road, that unfortunately has been established by the granting of the outline planning permission. So the access to the site and its cater ability to cater for this number of dwellings has already been agreed as part of the outline, so we can't now consider that again. Um, and in relation to the other point about whether county highways have agreed this, um, yes, they have. It's been backwards and forwards probably about six times between ourselves, the developer, and county highways to get amended plans to ensure that this scheme is compliant with everything that they want, but they have agreed. Okay, thank you. If I can, <coughs> if I can ask then, um, I think myself and Councillor Copeland are almost telepathic on this one. Um, in regards to, uh, I'm particularly interested in, in regards to the Kentdale. Mm -hmm. Could you show me how that sits on the plan in relation to the rear of it? Well, you. And the rear elevation that you can see is the one that backs onto the parking spaces. So it's situated between two other houses. Uh, and again, another one here. So we've got so windows on the three public elevations. Yep. And the other one is onto the parking spaces. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to. So the, what the, the house on the other side of the parking space, is that also a Kentdale? No. Are the windows to their rear elevation? No, I have checked that. There are, sorry, there are windows to the rear elevation, but there are no windows to habitable rooms that are impacted. There are, it, it's entirely compliant with residential de design guide in terms of separation. Yeah. I'm sorry if I'm not being clear enough. The, the, Kent, the elevation of the Kentdale mm -hmm. that looks, well, it doesn't look. The, Just has a door. It, yeah, the, that goes onto a car park. Yes. Car park bays. Yep. So that's just blank. Yes. The property on the other side <laughs> of the bays, mm -hmm. the elevation that's looking onto those bays, is that blank? Uh, I believe it is. I would have to double check exactly which property that because is. Because that, that gives me concerns. We've spoken often about car park areas and... Um, and, and that there's no sort of natural observance of anything going on in those areas. Um, and I also have to say that I'm concerned about the, the design and appearance of this. I think it's, it's pretty much a standard uh, Taylor Wimpy uh, design. They've made an effort to do some, some sills in brick, but there's not always lintels above them, certainly not on the... Uh, on the windows that are above above uh, ground ground level, and I was kind of half surprised. This picks up on what Councillor Tony Lloyd said. Actually, I, I was quite surprised at hearing that the appearance is in keeping with neighbouring properties. Well, it depends which ones you look at. If you look at the ones at the bottom of <coughs> um, Rectory Drive. Rectory Drive Possibly so, uh, but they're certainly not like the ones across the way uh, on the old um, Exel club site. Very modern design um, uh, and that. Uh, and I have to say, the, the, what, the examples that we've got printed in front of us don't include all of what we're seeing on the, on the 3D ones. For example, on these, I see no example of the gable-fronted <coughs> properties. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it might make a difference. 
So we concision an application without all of the design plans in front of us. The issue over the pepper potting of the social housing I think is really important. And whilst it's been described as being in three areas, I think it, there's still groupings, whereas they could be... I mean, I've been, to, I've been to any number of estates, if that's the way you term it, where actually you can't tell the difference between a social, a social housing element and one that's been sold privately. Indeed, I've seen them where there are a pair of semis, and one social rented, and one's uh, sold. And um, it, it does give me real concern uh, about that. Councillor Ian Lloyd is exactly right about the flooding under, under the bridge, but I've got to work on the theory that that would be um, sorted out if this development was to, to go ahead. Is there any member not already spoken that wishes to? No, yeah, yes. Grant, Councillor Grant. It's before as to not really in keeping with the area and as to the pepper potting, it's important that uh, we don't sort of segregate different types of housing from others. Uh, the only thing that I'd add with regards to the view for the house on the uh, left-hand side is it would be facing the bank of the A444, uh, which uh, would be quite, um, unless they're doing anything with regards to the sound protection, uh, anything else other than that, uh, which would be quite overgrown, probably full of litter that's difficult to reach and uh, difficult for anyone to do anything about, especially if there's fencing. So it wouldn't be a pretty sight for them unless there's anything put in there to mitigate that. OK, the only Lloyd wishes to come back, and then I'm going to... Well, the officer just said, as far as the... Uh... Ian, what Ian spoke about with the bridge down the bottom end. I, I think it's, it's very important that whether we can make a decision whether that is the fact that this planning co uh, committee has raised again their the concern of the development of the road, whatever. We're talking about the bridge, but we have one hell of a monster right by the uh, Cross Keys Boozer. <coughs> we've got the roundabouts there, we've got the mm. kill, children's school, We've got shopping and everything there. It is one hell of a there. We've lived there all our damn life and we know just exactly how bad. And we're going to put 92 houses. The only way in is to hit that uh, island there where it is. By the library. Well, it was a library. It's now I think it's a children's uh, uh, thing now. But that, uh, that is... But OK, we can't make a decision down there. But what we are, I want to record that the fact is we did speak about the road, the bad condition there, and the people there are going to, well, I just, they're, they've got a monster as it is. And the other thing is, and I'll, and I'll pack up, because down, I voted against it due to the roads and stuff down the bottom last time, with the way they got done, because I don't know how a lorry or something is going to get on to detect the furniture under that bridge, because they're going to have to sink the road again to get further down, because you're going to go into the rubber ground down the bottom. It is one hell of an aerial down there, and we, we can't do anything about, say anything about it. I think we ought to, that at least now, it is recorded that somebody has brought the issues up in here and very concerned about that area, the roads and, the, and ran by the cross keys. So nobody can say we've ignored it or whatever, but it is bad. It is really is bad down there. And every one of us who spoke today, and I'll finish, has spoke about design and how they've done it, pepperated one up there. And I think what uh, Chris has said is absolutely bang on. Uh, it must have been somebody sits there, I mean, it's, Putting people out that you are oh, what you bought, yours cheap, but you're a social. It is really is bad. This design, I've, I've been on here 20, about 23 years. This is a really is, well, it's, it's hard to understand it, what they've done. It is really a bad design. Thank you. It's, okay, thank you. It, it has been moved and seconded the recommendation, which is to grant planning permission subject to the conditions printed. All those in favour of that? And against? I think that's everybody. Abstentions? Okay, so the recommendation hasn't been approved. Uh, 
if somebody would like to move something else okay if it helps I'll do it sounds tough when we're doing it twice but you know why I always do that first one um, I will move refusal on the grounds of the design appearance and the layout of the proposal Hang on, I ain't got there yet. The uh, as part well as part of that design thing, particularly that Kentdale issue, and also uh, the the um, the isolation, if that's the word, of the affordable housing element that the committee would feel that it should be pepper potted throughout the throughout the proposal. Okay. If, um, I heard. I heard what was said. I heard what was said. What? I heard what was said about the the highway objections, and I think some of us would probably share them. However, we don't have any objection from the uh, <coughs> county highways, and I don't think that would be sustainable if it went to appeal. Agreed. <laughs> it wouldn't be but, you, but, but you're happy with the with the members' things on the the reasons that I've given. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I've, I've moved this. Um, right, I've heard no other amendments to that. So if people happy. But I, I moved it. Did somebody second it? Just to be absolutely clear on it. And just so that we're clear on it, it was to do with the design appearance and layout and the pepper potting of the affordable housing element. Members clear on what we're voting on? All those in favour of that? And against? No abstention, so that application is refused okay we can move on to item number two described as the site in King Street, Bedworth, which we all know was the British Queen. Okay. Thank you, Chair. This application is for premises in King Street, Bedworth, and is for two and three storey extensions and the conversion of the former British Queen public house, and is to create 12 flats. It includes a new vehicular access to King's Gardens. <coughs> Just there. The public house has been closed for some years. The site is on the corner of King Street and King's Gardens and looks onto the mini roundabout which joins King Street and Queen Street. The site is between the Bedworth Town Centre and the railway station. The main elevation of the pub is onto King Street. That's the main elevation there. To the southeast of the site is a building that was the former theatre and the side wall of this theatre is the eastern boundary to the site. This neighbouring building now appears to be used for storage. Beyond this is a row of terraces which largely appear to be used for businesses. On the opposite side of King Street are two former garages, the nearest one of which is now an A1 retail unit, and there is a row of terrace residential properties slightly further away. The side elevation of the pub fronts onto King's Gardens, and the <coughs> former beer garden is beyond this. King's Gardens com com comprises of residential properties. Number two, King's Gardens, is immediately behind the site, it's that one there, and sides onto the site. The nearest elements of this neighbouring property to the site are extensions. The domestic property of 82A King Street, just about to see it there, is on the opposite side of King's Gardens to the public house and fronts onto King's Gardens, uh, onto King Street. The public house is red brick with a gabled slate roof 
and has a stone plinth detailing around the windows to the front. There have been eight letters of objection from six addresses. The objections include that King's Gardens is a steep cul-de-sac which is dangerous in the ice. The proposed car park is to be accessed onto this residential road and there are concerns about noise and antisocial behaviour within the proposed car park. In addition, there are concerns that the proposal will exacerbate parking issues in the area. The objections also voice concerns that children pass the site to get to the nearest school and that the junction is already dangerous. Concerns were also raised that the additional drainage impact could exacerbate previous problems with drainage to King's Gardens. The key considerations are shown on the PowerPoint in front of you. In relation to the principle of development and housing need, the site is in a sustainable location <coughs> close to the town centre, services and to the train station. It is a brownfield site and therefore complies with national and local policy in relation to its reuse. It is already established that the borough currently has a housing land supply need. In respect of residential amenity, the proposal fully complies with the residential design guide in relation to the distance standards from windows of existing properties to the windows of the new apartments uh, to protect both existing and the proposed <coughs> residents. In reference to visual amenity, it is proposed that the pub is retained but extended to the front and side of the original building and to the rear of the original pub. The new front extension is proposed to be three storeys, whereas the existing pub is two storeys. However, the roof and window design is proposed to match the detailing on the front of the pub. The connection between the two buildings at first floor is to be stepped with an area of the roof lower to provide definition between the two areas and to break up the massing. You can see that in the middle there. The extension to the rear side, fronting onto King's Gardens, that part there, is to be the same height as the pub and is proposed to mirror the existing gable. It is proposed to condition the materials so that the existing pub is matched as closely as possible. In terms of highway safety, the proposal will have 17 parking spaces, which equates to 1.4 spaces per apartment. The area will also provide a bin storage and storage for bicycles. Plans have been amended during the application process and county highways no longer have objections to the scheme subject to conditions. In relation to noise... National guidance states that a good standard of amenity must be provided for both existing and proposed residents. There is car parking proposed adjacent to number two King's Gardens. However, the council's environmental health team have not objected to this. A noise assessment has been submitted to evidence that noise to the future occupiers can be guaranteed and environmental health have no objection to a condition for the details of glazing and mechanical ventilation for the apartments. Environmental health have also requested the normal standard condition that relates to any possible contaminant <coughs> during the destruction and the treatment thereof. As the development is within the high-risk area for potential coal mine workings, a coal mining risk assessment has been submitted and the coal authority subsequently had no objection subject to a condition to deal with adequate investigative works during construction. In relation to ecology, the council's parks team have requested a condition so that it, ha so that it has to be demonstrated that the site clearance will be acceptable and not cause any risk to wildlife. The only 106 contribution request that has been received is from the parks team for play and open space, which totals a fee of 15,937. This is towards access improvement to the Miners' Welfare Park and to increase allotment capacity within Queen Street. This will need to be provided via a 106 legal agreement. In conclusion, it is considered that the key considerations are acceptable or can be made acceptable via conditions and that the 106 requirement can be secured via a 106 legal agreement. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pandare. I'm uh, 
in the King's Garden, Queen Street and Brickington Road area are already suffering with the parking problem there. So we had a quite few time meetings there and uh, many people are complaining and uh, obsessed for uh, vehicles like fire, NHS uh, people, uh, there are already problem there. And uh, the objections you may have already heard, you know, there was 12 obje objections, but a very steep area where there will be more parking um, for those flats will be made. And um, uh, the 17 uh, parking spaces, uh, to me, is not enough these days. You know, so they may be calculated according to the old plans. And these days, average is two cars per person or per household, plus relatives and friends coming to see them. There will be more spaces should be allocated for the off-street car parking for the residents. And um, the, finally, uh, if there's a, this plan is go ahead, and I would like uh, to attach conditions so that uh, the construction workers and all the vehicles are not going to park on the King Street. There should be parking place space made available before construction work start. Thank you. If you can press your button up, please. Clarification. No. Anything to come back on at the moment? No. no? In that case, to enable debate to take place, can I move the recommendation? Is that seconded? <coughs> Any member? Councillor Graham. Certainly confirmed that there are parking issues on this road already and also on uh, Queen Street. Um, these issues were raised at a recent meeting uh, at Saunders Club in Bedworth last month, uh, along with many others. Uh, I am concerned that it could potentially be adding uh, issues to that road. I mean, I know that there's 17 spaces there, which is mostly adequate, but it's just a shame that there's not enough space for maybe one or two extra spaces, because I do feel in this day and age that a lot of people do have upwards of two cars, and I just hate to see extra um, parking problems on King's Gardens and... As we know, it's a bit of a difficult road to get out of as well. It's just a shame that there's not any more mitigation that could be done along those lines. But with regards to construction traffic, what are the plans when this place is being built? Because surely it would make more sense if, uh, if the car park could be built first so that the construction traffic can park there rather than parking on King's Garden itself. Or are there plans for the construction traffic to park a good distance away from King's Gardens and Queen Streets as things are? Councillor Copeland. I think the officer's looking, Councillor Graham. The, the officer will come back when they find the thing. Councillor Copeland. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, actually, I think that's a, an excellent idea because there is no question of parking issues round about that. The issue, I suppose, is is so close to the town centre. What uh, we have here, though, we've got to be mindful of is the relevant planning history where we actually have approved an application for 28 apartments and two houses. Now, I can well remember that application coming here and lots of people come in to speak and be against it. That has actually got approval and we now have, in my opinion, a less damaging to the things, you know, people's concerns, application before us. Now, it puts me in the position, while I appreciate the parking things there, this application, in my opinion, if it went ahead, would be better than the original. So we have to remember <coughs> that there is already an active permission for 28 and two houses. And it is a brownfield site, so it's exactly the sort of site we should be developing. It's interesting that highways have no objections because of the... No, they don't see the problems of parking. Well, I know over the years they have been down there, uh, and certainly have been down, and I've had a petition from there. Well, of course, it's a highway matter, county council matter, but they haven't got any objections. The well, thing that's really interesting to me is, I know as a fact, as the residents do down there, that a lot of the people that park there are actually county council employees working in the big building. Uh, so maybe that's something that could be chased up. As for the spaces, we have 17 spaces for 12 flats. 
Now, I hear what people say that we ideally we need two spaces for you know, every dwelling and whatever, but I'm afraid it's not the real world and how things are being <laughs> developed. And actually, 17 spaces for 12 flats is quite a generous one, because I'm not sure on the last application that, you know, considering there was well, double the amount of dwellings that we had, double the amount of spaces. I did have concerns on the last application about number two King's Garden, because there's no doubt about it, there's the big slope down there that causes massive uh, problem. I don't know, I honestly don't know sometimes, but it's really I see how people get out of there. Uh, but this one, <coughs> although the car park is to the side of two King's Gardens, it's certainly, in my opinion, better than what the, you know, the other application had. So, as far as I'm concerned, Chair, it's, I suppose, if you like, a lesser of two or the other possible uh, evil, shall we say, in people's eyes. I'm going to vote for this, Chair, unless I hear something that convinces me otherwise. And I think the parking, I personally would like to see King's Gardens have a residence parking uh, thing. But the problem is, that's nothing to do with this council, that's the county council that would have to do that. Now, they've come up with various reasons over the years why they're not willing to do that. I think it's wrong. I think it's very unfair of the residents down there. I know for a fact down the bottom, there's people in the past had real issues getting ambulances there for people on their way to hospital. And that is really sad. But it, it's a case of... I'm going to vote for this chair because I wouldn't like this in front of me, vote this down, me, and then the 28 apartments and two houses went ahead, or something other. So that's what planning's like, I'm afraid. Sometimes you have to go and run with something that you're not 100% happy with. But that's the situation I'm in, chair. Thank okay, thank you. Just for it out of my head, if I don't ask the question now, and it's on, it's on that it's on that point about the existing permission. Um, I think I'm pretty correct. Is that that could still be implemented? So, in, so is it the case that if this one receives a permission, it's actually got two permissions on the site, and either or could be implemented still? Yes, that's correct. This one doesn't supersede, it doesn't take it over. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay, I know what we were hoping for, but... Um, Councillor Tony Lloyd. I've also down there, I, I thought uh, the area certainly needs something doing to it. Because I also believe if I went down, I think this planning committee went down, and we had a look at the tyre business. We gave permission for the tyre business down there, and they wouldn't it's argue. Be it. better. Yeah. And again, we were arguing how they're going to get the vehicles in and out down the bottom. I mean, because we've been down there now, vehicles, because our, our office was there one time. And how they're going, but we've got 28 houses, we've got a planning for a, a factory on there. Uh, so, <coughs> as much as this, I looked at this and I thought, well, it is very close to. Islands again. It is one of the most busiest areas in Bedworth again. Coming from Borkins up the top there and round the ring road, it's, it's horrendous again. But unfortunately, we, uh, if we've got permission for 28 hours, we're going to have a, a few problems to, to, to turn into it. But I looked at this and thought, well, it is right smack on, on the side of the road. And how, how overbearing it can be and intimidating for when you come round there. Uh, driving and doing whatever. Then I thought about the East End Road at the top there where we built all the flats, how close they are to the road. Uh, that This one ain't as close as them, it just worried me. But it is overbearing and it is there, but, uh, which is the best of the two here with the factory of doing tyres, putting 28 houses there, or putting this and allowing this to go in, in, in there. Because it's already going to go uh, our old boundaries. We ain't going to be, uh, win it by turning it down because uh, they'll just go to appeal and win it. Uh, or the other one will come in, into effect. But I just was concerned how, how it was overbearing to, to the roads on that area because it's, it's quite busy with shops and the, the vet and everything. Uh, but um, as Bob said, it's, uh, 
sometimes in planning you have to write your song and just do whatever. You can make your feelings felt about it, but uh, and, and just let things happen. On, on this occasion, I just wish the people look up there where it's really uncomfortable. A couple of things. Um, firstly, I mean, I've listened to what they said about um, uh, two applications, and yet, yeah, I'll, I'll more than not, unless somebody convinces me otherwise, uh, vote for this application with the hope we get this one rather than the, the latter one. Um, uh, as has been said, best of the two evils. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm parking. I know there's parking issues all over the borough. Um, you know, we've got these problems everywhere. Um, I know it's horrendous uh, down King's Gardens um, already. My biggest concern, though, is the, uh, the car park at the rear end. Um, it is one of my pet hates, having them at the back. And how are they going to access... Um, is there going to be a restriction on the access to the car park? That's what I'm after. Is there going to be some physical barrier to stop people from elsewhere parking in there? Um, because if there isn't, then you're going to have to, every Tom, Dick and Harry park in there to go shopping up the town. Um, I, I couldn't see it in there, so <coughs> if somebody can answer that, it uh, would be appreciated. Um, I'm going to ask, well, Jackie and Claire or whoever... Um, because that kind of covers the two points as well. We had, we had the thing, it might, might come as amendment depending on what's, what's said, is about can, they, can we condition that the construction vehicles use the car park area if this was approved, uh, and also whether we could have another condition saying that it had to be restricted ask, access to residents only to the car park. So, so it, it, it's... It's both is yes, we could condition both. Yeah. We could add a condition for a construction management plan be provided before development. Um, we could state in that uh, that we'd need to be shown where construction traffic uh, would manoeuvre and park uh, during the construction time. Whether or not we could enforce actually being parked on the road during construction uh, would may be difficult, but at least we could put a construction management plan on there. I think the actual question was, can the car park area be constructed first to enable the construction vehicles to be parked on there? Yeah, the construction management plan would incorporate that area. It would be hard standing uh, to be used from the outset of the, the construction. Okay, and yeah. could we condition that the the access to the car park would be for residents restricted to residents only, i.e., a, a, a barrier or a gate? Yeah, that, is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Okay. Well, there is a boundary treatment on there. We could probably add that, um, add access to that. We'd have to be careful on that because we, it would have to be set back enough distance for a car to park in the front. Obviously, that could potentially mean a loss of some of the parking spaces. So um, I think it would be something that, yes, we can add by a condition, um, and then we'd have to agree in terms of highway safety with county afterwards. OK, so um, we haven't got to the stage of a vote yet, but nevertheless, we, we can add conditions in in case it gets approval. If it got turned down, then clearly, but I, I don't want it to get to that point and us not miss it, and then if it went to appeal, it's not part of it. So um, I'm going to ask if members are happy that we add those conditions into this application in regard to the car park construction first to enable the... You, you've got the drift, haven't you? And that the, um, there'll be controlled access for residents residents only onto that car park once the building was constructed and lived in yes. yeah right is everybody happy with that yes. anybody not okay then right um we haven't got anybody else i know councillor graham wants to come back in i'll bring you back in councillor graham but i just want you to briefly say it's a really difficult one it's a, a really balanced one um and you know, what we've got is, it's not just the old British Queen site, we've got that whole run of land there that's now become a, a derelict site. 
and a main approach into the into the town. We've got that. We've got the corner pin side over on on the other side, which we have to bear in mind as well. Um, however, if you look at transport wise, we 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 kind of all well, have our suspicions about the amount of parking and car park spaces. But you actually, if you look at the the policies you can't get a more sustainable site than this in regards to it's next door to the railway station you've got the bus stop outside um, you know so it, 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 there's a balance to keep and uh, although the, the uh, you know it looks like that we're going to keep <coughs> or likely to keep the the design on the front of the building it, and at the end of the day it, it's, it's quite an unusual frontage to a building and one that's much loved by uh, the bed, Bedworth people that go past it um, and the the other thing that I've t- maybe I live in cloud cuckoo land but if this is approved today and it's done in, in, in a manner that, that looks good perhaps it'll encourage those people that own the corner pin to come forward and, and, and do their do, and do theirs um, I have to say I do have some other some concerns as well, um, and maybe they'll be alleviated. Um, I was concerned about the actual height of the building, particularly the pro- proposed new one to the side of the pub, so fronting onto King Street. It's substantially higher than than the pub itself, um, and again. At that part of King, you know, King Street, it isn't really like that. Um, and if it had been kept to the height of the pub, I would have been happy. Um, but again, it, it, there's maybe balances um, to be to be struck on that. I know it's a little way away from it, but one of my concerns is King Street, Stroke, Borkington Road has had a fair bit of development in regards to flats and stuff. If you go that bit further down on the right hand side, they're very they're very tall buildings. Um, and we've got to be careful that we don't create that tunnel effect down there. Um, but it is a real balance. Um, Councillor Councillor Gran, I'll bring you back in and, and then we'll move to the vote. It's uh, definitely a very tricky one and there's a balance that's got to be struck here. And I've just got a couple of questions which I think would help me make my decision. Firstly, the first um, planning permission which was granted, I believe happened before I was even elected. So I'm not entirely sure when that happened. How long until that runs out? And secondly, um, with regards to this, is it the same applicant as the ones who got planning permission last time for the 28? Because surely they wouldn't be pursuing a much smaller development if that's not what they wanted at this stage. Yeah, it's not, I don't think it's the same applicant. Definitely not. No, and it's November this year that the other application runs out and expires, so they would have to renew it or just let it lapse. Okay. Right, okay. Anything to... that you need to wind up on, no? Okay. In that case, we've got... A recommendation that's printed in front of us, uh, plus the two conditions that we added in. So are we all clear what we're voting on? All those in favour of that? That's unanimous. Okay. So that's approved. Okay, if we can move on to item number three, which is Church Street, Nuneaton. Thank you, Chair. This is for a full planning application for 50 retirement apartments and ancillary facilities on the corner of Church Street, Mill Street and Vicarage Street, Nuneaton. The development proposes 25 one-bedroom and 25 two-bedroom apartments. The site is currently a council car park with the entrance off Church Street opposite the library and egress from Mill Street opposite two single-storey retail units. 
The proposal includes the demolition of the row of wooden retail units close to the car park opposite the library and provides parking for the proposed complex to the rear. To the rear of the site are Elliott Gardens and Riversley Park. The surrounding buildings are predominantly single or two-storey, with the exception being Dempster Court, which is three-storey. As the application is a major on council-owned land, the application has to be determined by the Planning Application Committee. Councillor Jill Shepherd has also called the application into committee. There have been three letters of objection from three neighbouring addresses with concerns about the loss of a public car park, request for the land to be extended into the park, request that greenfields out of town should be built on in preference to using car parks, and concerns in relation to noise to the new residents of the properties from late night businesses within the town. In addition, there have been six letters of support from six addresses stating that the type of property is much needed. It will be an enhancement of the town in terms of its type of use and its social and visual amenity. Uh, they've also stated it provides a facility for older people to continue independent living. It will make a sustainable use of a brownfield site and provides easy accessibility for services for the new residents and could provide a better nighttime economy within the town. A letter of comment from one address has been received noting that the site is sensitive to the surrounding green areas and views of St Nicholas Church would provide a dominating oppressive building not be in keeping with the area and that it should be given rigorous scrutiny to ensure it provides a full asset to the town. The key considerations are shown on the PowerPoint before you. In relation to the principle of residential development, it complies with policy in as much as it makes use of a brownfield site within a sustainable location and will be included within the council's housing figures. Therefore, the principle of development is set. However, local policy states that 25% of the apartments should be affordable. The applicant has confirmed that their business model does not allow for any provision of affordable housing. I plan to discuss this later in the presentation. In relation to residential amenity, the nearest residence is one residential flat above Reflex, which is 37 metres away, and the residence of Dempster Court, which is 35 metres away. It is considered that due to the distances involved that the proposal complies with the 30 metre distance set out within the residential design guide. In relation to the residential amenity of the new residents within the complex, a noise assessment has been submitted and the Council's Environmental Health consider that acceptable noise levels can be achieved via a condition relating to glazing and ventilation. In relation to the impact of the visual amenity, including the town centre, the proposal is two and a half storeys to Vicarage Street, broken up with gables and increases to three and three and a half storeys through to four storeys the closer the building gets to the roundabout with Church Street. This is to provide a landmark feature to this corner and is where the main entrance into the building is proposed to be. It is considered that the proposal will provide a strong positive feature to this entrance to the town. The height then reduces to three storey with some four storey gables to break up the massing on the elevation onto <coughs> Church Street. The frontage to George Elliott Gardens and Riversley Park also provides a strong feature and focal point with a mix of the building heights up to three storeys maximum. The scale, height and massing of the proposal is considered acceptable and would not be out of character. The elevations include brickwork with some render and some boarding to the rear. The boundary treatment is proposed to be black metal railings positioned on a small brick wall. The site is within the town centre conservation area and fairly close to the Grade 1 listed church and former old grammar school, <coughs> with the old vicarage and college buildings clustered Grade 2 listing slightly further away. In terms of the impact of the conservation area, the evidence based and appraisal carried out to instruct the creation of the conservation area highlights the negative 
existing features of this area, including poor visual amenity, a lack of coherence, and the temporary nature of the wooden retail units opposite the library, which are due to be, due to be demolished if this application goes through. Due to the distance to the nearest listed buildings, it is considered that there will be no impact to these from the development. In respect of highway safety, vehicular access will be from Mill Street, with the existing entrance being closed off. The proposal has 31 parking spaces, which is considered by officers to be acceptable, especially as we no longer have any safe guide guidance and due to the type of development and the fact that's within a town centre. A study was provided by the applicant which, which indicated that there was sufficient occupancy in other car parks to facilitate the loss of public car parking. The impact of vehicular movements was also assessed and considered acceptable by highways. Pedestrian access will be via the main entrance on the corner and on the corner of Church Street and Mill Street, and also from the car park to the rear. In terms of the impact of the town centre, it has already been stated that the location is sustainable and encourages the use of the town centre facilities, including public transport, and indeed this is reiterated by the NPPF, that states residential development within a town centre, actually assists with the town's vitality especially bearing in mind that residents within the development are more likely to make use of the local facilities. In respect of flood risk and drainage, the new development is currently in flood zone 2, which is 1 to 100 to 1 to 1,000 chance of flooding. However, this is based on data prior to the creation of the flood relief channel, and it is considered by the Environment Agency, who have no objections, that taking into consideration up-to-date data, flooding does not pose an issue, providing mitigation measures are taken, such as conditioning a minimal floor height. The county's flood risk management team consider that drainage is acceptable, subject to the submission by recondition of a drainage scheme and maintenance plan. In relation to air quality, the Council's environmental health team have requested mechanical ventilation instead of openable windows to the apartments fronting the highway. This is so that the apartments are mechanically ventilated from air to the rear of the building rather than relying on wind in windows opening onto the main roads and which can be achieved via condition. The county archaeology team consider that any archaeological artefacts are likely to have been destroyed by the previous development of the site. However, a condition is requested in order that archaeology work is carried out. In terms of ecology, an ecological report has been submitted and concluded that the site is unlikely to have any ecological value except for the mature horse chestnut on the corner of the site which is to be re retained as part of the development. In reference to planning obligations, planning obligations have been requested for affordable housing, play and open space, sports development, George Heliot Hospital Trust, the NHS and County Public House. However, the applicant has advised that they are unable to provide the 106 contributions due to viability issues. Where the lack of viability is cited by developers, the council will always request the submission of a full viability assessment so that costs can be independently scrutinised. These project costs have been considered by the council's principal land and property officer who has advised that the financial viability assessment is indeed robust and took into consideration all inputs including anticipated development values, costs and profit to arrive at the resident val residual value of the site. Officers also tested the financial viability of the site. The land and property officer went on to make the following observations. The gross sales revenues generated and individual apartment sales prices are within the range of market values to be expected for this type of development. 
The outlay on construction costs also appear reasonable given the proposed design and slightly higher than normal specification. The professional fees, marketing fees, void property costs and finance costs are considered to be in line with the market. For this type of residential development, it would be normal to see a profit of around 20% on the gross development value. They further concurred that the residential land value was actually calculated, if calculated, would be at 8,451, which is far below the actual value of the land. This demonstrated the inability to support a payment towards off-site affordable housing and the fees quoted are significantly below the benchmark values. If viability appraisals were run at the benchmark land value or at the agreed purchase price, which is obviously substantially higher than the 8,451, the profit would dip significantly below the 20%, rendering the development unattractive to potential developers and therefore unviable. The resultant residual land value is below the benchmark site value for an alternative commercial use. So there is, there is no financial headroom available to fund 106 planning obligations in this case. He concluded by stating that on the basis of the information supplied in the report and his research, that their appraisal appears to be sound and leads to the conclusion that it would be unviable if paying for 106 contributions. The council is obliged by law to secure the best value from the sale of its land. Even inputting a value lower than what is expected for the purchase of the site would mean profits are below the 20% that developers would expect even without the 106 payments. Ground rents have take, been taken into consideration in the assessment and in terms of maintenance fees, fees that future occupiers will pay, these have to be a, a realistic amount and specific for the maintenance needs of the complex and will only include a small management fee. This maintenance fee is not intended to make a profit and is similar to any leasehold development. The MPPF states that councils should be flexible in terms of planning obligations to ensure that sustainable development is viable and not threatened when taking into account the normal cost of development to ensure a competitive return for both the landowner and the developer. Therefore, it is considered by officers that planning obligations cannot be requested on this occasion as per the MPPF and therefore refusal, refusal may be difficult to defend at appeal on this basis. Housing maintains their objection because it is contrary to local policy. The head of the council's land and property estates, the head of town centres, and the county's head of transport and economy are in support of the application as they consider that the development is essential to kickstart the regeneration of the town centre and the Vicarage Street area and show developer commitment to the town as a place to invest in as well as actually bringing in money by the sale of the site to stimulate and support regeneration to promote the town's long-term vitality and vi viability. In conclusion, it is considered that the key considerations are acceptable or can be made acceptable via conditions and that on this occasion the advantages that the, dis de sorry, that the development will bring to the town centre will outweigh the lack of 106 provision. It is therefore recommended that the application is approved subject to the conditions as printed on the agenda and the addendum. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Lisa Matthewson. Members Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak where I am the agent for McCarthy and Stone. We are pleased that your officer has recommended approval for the application. It has involved significant pre-application discussions with officers and consultation with the local community members and including the MP. The development constitutes a well-designed scheme in a highly sustainable location which would provide much needed housing for the elderly in the area where there is an identified need. The residents of the scheme would shop locally and aid the regeneration of the town centre, as you have heard. 
There are no objections to the scheme from offices. McCarthy and Stone submitted a viability assessment, as you have heard, as part of the application, which was undertaken by a company called Alder King. This was reviewed by the Principal Land and Property Officer at the Council, who agreed it would be unviable for any Section 106 contributions to be made. The comment on the business model of Section 106 is wholly inaccurate. Where appropriate and viability assessments do allow, McCarthy and Stone would provide financial contributions to affordable and other matters. However, in this case, it has also been identified that it cannot afford anything which your officer has gone through in vast detail. Just in relation to the late papers and the addendum before you, our CIS guidance states that reappraisals are only suited to long-term and multi-phase sites. This is a single block of sheltered apartments and a single-phase scheme and not a large strategic site and therefore it is not appropriate to be retested. A reappraisal is therefore not supported by either local or national policy and nor has been requested by officers. McCarthy and Stone are keen to develop this site and will not sit on it for years and are therefore not happy with this addition. Service charge, as you have heard, is not a profit stream. It does cover the running and maintenance costs. In terms of point number three on the addendum, in terms of the air pollution, this is potentially something which could be considered and incorporated within condition nine if deemed necessary by your officers. In summary, this development before you fully accords with both national and local planning policy, and I therefore urge you to approve the application with no reassessment, but subject to appropriately worded planning conditions. Thank you for your time. Could I just ask one? Is, it, um, is every unit within the proposal for, for sale, then? Bedroom units for private sale. Okay, thank you. Reverend Newborough. Yes. Well, thank you for this opportunity to say a few words regarding the proposed development uh, by McCarthy and Stone. And I, I stand as a being born and bred here in Nuneaton and educated at Abbey Street and at Grammar School and trained at Clarkson Engineering. So Nuneaton is very much my home. It was in September 2017 when the public was invited to an open day at the Heritage Centre in Coton Road. Uh, to see the plans being proposed to build residential accommodation for the elderly by McCarthy and Stone. The large number of people who attended that open day was a strong indicator of the support and interest by the people both of Nuneaton and Bedworth in the proposed development. The plans were very comprehensive and advisors were available to answer any questions from the public who attended that, that open day. Since then, I took the opportunity to visit other developments by McCarthy and Stone at Hinckley, Solihull and in Leamington. Uh, they're all built to the highest specification, may I say, with every aspect of retirement living well catered for. It addressed the community needs, offering areas of interest of like-minded people, and it was not surprised to find that a large number of these apartments had already been sold in a very short period of time. The proposals for the Nuneaton site confirms how this development will continue and maintain the high standards uh, which can be expected from a national organisation uh, of high repute as, Mark, as McCarthy and Stone represents. Such a development will help people of a certain age seeking to downsize, releasing properties into the housing market for young families. It will also bring added revenue into the local shops and allows easy access to the town shops and eating places and such important services uh, such as bus and rail links. For recreation there is the Memorial Gardens alongside and Riversley Park nearby. The construction and design of the building will enhance and raise the tone of the area and its impressive appearance to both visitors and local people alike as they enter the town. There's been considerable thought and care given to the plans to make them the best in the area. And I would ask the Planning Committee to support this development as it will bring benefits to our town, to its environment and to its people. Approval to these plans will also indicate a step forward in the regeneration of our loved town in the centre and its best, in the best possible way. Thank you, Mr Chairman. OK, thank you. Are there any points of clarification? No? Anything to come back on at this stage? 
In that case, to enable debate to take place, can I move the recommendation which is to grant planning permission? Is that seconded? Any member? <coughs> Councillor Shepherd. We have had objections from Housing and Park, which to myself carries some weight. With four stories, this development will be a dominating presence in that location and also the conservation area in regard to scale, height and massive. The developer does do rental apartments as is not being considered in this development and would have delivered our 25% element. I have looked on the development's website. One bedroom apartment taking an average around 106 255000 I cannot understand the lack of viability when sale of one two-bedroom apartment will cover all the 106 monies we've requested. I personally think it is fair and reasonable to expect 106 monies and affordable housing in relation to this development. If the committee is mindful of approval, uh, can the conditions on air quality and a sum of off-site contribution be asked for as conditions? And I request that the viability assessment, including lifetime profits, is uh, retested when 80% of the units are built. Thank you, Chair. Anything yet, or do you want me to take all the questions first? Okay, Jackie. The three questions there in terms of air quality, that has been considered as part of the application and it is by a condition. The air quality, in, in as much as uh, the flats to the front, will have mechanical ventilation. Um, the items on your addendum uh, from Councillor Condacore for the fact that he wanted some testing done, um, yes, it could be done, but it's not going to actually help the application before you. All that's going to provide is uh, future um, readings when the actual building is already there. So I'm not sure whether that would actually help certainly in terms of the actual planning application in front of you. Um, the air quality, the area isn't in an air quality management at the moment, so it would be difficult for us to um, actually condition that as part of it. It's not part of the environmental house in terms of uh, monitoring within that area. In terms of an off-site contribution, we've already actually gone through the uh, viability assessment they would have considered that as part of the viability assessment and no 106 or off-site provision um, is considered viable in terms of this particular um, site as it is, as it stands. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. I think that this is a very interesting application. As I was leaving the house this morning with all the bump and stuff that we've had through the post recently, my nan turned around to me and said, so you're packing me off to a home tonight? And in the usual manner when we come to planning, I said I couldn't possibly comment. Um, but what we are looking at here is something which addresses a need which is desperate in our borough. We've already done some work in Bedworth with some of the um, assisted living and, and elderly people's um, uh, accommodation there. And... Nuneaton is now experiencing an acute issue in that too. We have an elderly population and that demographic is only going to increase. So from that perspective, McCarthy and Stone have hit on to a surefire demographic, a target audience to actually go for in that respect. And normally, yes, I would share the concerns about the lack of Section 106 contributions and the affordable housing, because affordable housing is an area of need within our borough. But I'm looking at it through a different prism in that elderly accommodation is also a desperate need in our borough, and it is looking at it in a different way. It's not the perfect way to deal with it, but it is looking at a need within our borough. Um, I have to say, I think the indicative drawings from what they've sent in the post by email and and what are on there are striking. They set a statement of ambition for what we want our town centre to be. I think it looks quite pleasant, actually, from the way, it's look, from the way it looks. And the feedback I've had from residents has said that it looks as if it's a place they will be willing to go into. Indeed, the phone call that I had from a resident said, I'm willing to buy off plan now. So you've already got one down, 49 to go. Um, 
In terms of the heights of the buildings, I think it's about setting a statement as you enter into the town centre from that particular area. And also, if you look at the other buildings in the area of the town centre around there, I don't think it's not in keeping, really. You've got the job centre, you've got Imperium Law, Reflex, where they are high-rise buildings. You've got the uh, post office buildings, as they, want, as they were, which are quite tall buildings as well. So it's not as if it's out of keeping with the town centre. And I think our town centres need regeneration. And as the officers have said, this is a method for kick-starting the regeneration of that end of the new town centre. And I very much hope that more applications will come forward to look at that end of town. So I will be supporting this application because I think it ticks quite a few of the boxes of what we need to do to move this borough, and in particular, the Neaton forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lucas. Makes a statement as a building. Chairman, I agree with that. It certainly will make a statement as a building, that I, without question. I sat on a committee, I don't know what's happened to it, and I sat on with our officers, the chief who uh, look after these type of these doors, where we have contractors and everybody, where we were going to develop the end, all the end of that, shops and everything, up to the library, and all down there was going to be redeveloped, because for the top end where the co-op was, was going to be developed as well with various companies, which I think what happened. And I sat on a committee with, where people were going to bring money in. This is with Warwickshire County Council sitting on as well, this committee was there to develop this end of the borough. I, okay, I was knocked off as leader of the uh, uh, planning from then. I don't know what, went, what has happened to this committee of development of this end. And it also, when I sit here and listen to an officer, I may have interpreted it wrong, but I will say how I interpreted it, that we'd have trouble of uh, uh, turning down with our, our land. Let me make it up to be where I stand. We don't have to sell any of our land. If we do not want to sell our land, we don't have to. If we don't want that on our land, we don't have to put it on our land. So if the interpretation is that we can't do whatever, let me make it clear, as far as I'm concerned as a councillor, because I will certainly take it out where if I need to. <coughs> our land, I want to know as well, please, we've got a, a car park there that's fielding where we put a wheel short of car parking in this town, it's getting big. You've you just only got a ground today, we're on the road today. It was horrendous in and out of it, that's not even better today. Now look at the cars and everything coming in and out of the park. That little car park there has yielded this capital quite considerable money over the years in revenue of looking out and giving parking for our people. We've been criticising about getting rid of car parks. We've been criticised of being about car parking fees and all the rest of it is going down. We have a car park that's full every day in there and it brings deals and money. Is, is this over here? And, and it will, just this, the car park losing that car park and this going up yield the same money that if we leave it there for the next 10 years, if we get more money and more parking for our people or whatever. And will somebody please tell me what we're doing about the development of this end of the borough? Because it seems to have gone, gone whatever. That piece of land there is most essential to the development of this borough of this of Dunedin. I agree you need it. I'm in that age group that needs going in and getting some places. I have no doubt about that. But to put a, a, something there, one wants just to put on there, they can come in. Why don't we go and knock down the... Uh, I mean, stupid, I suppose, being a uh, road walk and put it on. We can just walk in and tell us we're going to build on our car parks and our land. It's most essential to our development. It is the most development of encouraging people to come and, and park in and, and to, to go shopping and develop our, our city and the town centres. Taking this away, we'll put the, the uh, shackles on. Any, any committee that's sitting, I don't know if it still sits and developing right down the bottom end there, the shackles on it, as much as we want to. And, it, and that is not overdeveloped four storeys high into the, it, it's conducive to, have a, have a, you have a look anything round there. Even the flats over the road are not that high. 
It's on that corner to come round by the library and everything. It's a monster. It is developed there. It takes everything away from this council in trying to develop our future. You know, we do need them. I, I have no doubt that we need them because we just had a, I was on the chair when we do the care home in Bedford and all that. I, I met a nice place out there with Warwickshire County Council. Warwickshire County Council still want to develop these care homes as big space like we've got in Bedford. They want to do it. If, I've already spoke to the uh, housing before. They're talking to Kathy Morton about where there's land and where it can be put and these houses can be put for development for older people in Dunedin. But to put it on there, on that corner there, you are tying the hands of the, uh, this borough, this council in its development for the future of Dunedin. And we certainly need, need a development. We want to make it better for people to come in and park, who want to come in and do shopping. Uh, and that would, uh, but please don't somebody, as I say, I might misinterpret it, Chair. Tell me I, I can't vote or stop something that, on our land. If we don't want to do something on our land, this planning commission committee can make that decision. Thank you. Can I, can I be clear to members, and the legal officer will tell me if I'm wrong, the, the sale of that land or not, or any other piece of land, isn't for consideration by this planning committee. The planning committee will deal with the planning application it's got in front of it on whether it's the principle of development is correct or not. Um, uh, in, in regards to whether the council itself should sell a piece of land or its arguments about car parking, that's a policy matter for another place. Absolutely correct. Thank you. Um, did you have anything apart from that that you needed to come back on? I think you've covered that in as much as you were on about the actual car parking, uh, sufficient car parking. As I say, there was a survey carried out as part of the application uh, and it was found that there are there were adequate spaces for the loss of this car park and obviously we take that in, into consideration, parking and land and property, we take that into consideration. Uh, in terms of what's happening in the town centre, again, it's not before you now. That is that is a discussion of another committee elsewhere, and I'm not privy to that information either. Uh, but what we're hoping, uh, Land and Property, um, the head of Land and Property, the head of town centre, and the head of uh, county uh, econo e economies are all uh, in support of the application to help <coughs> the town centre rather than to um, harm it. Councillor Longden. When we first looked at these different options about turning some commercial properties and office space into residential accommodation, I was quite excited about that. When this one first, I got first sight of this, I got quite excited about this. Uh, and I thought, well, that's fine. Uh, the arguments about height and stuff, you can hardly argue that when you're 200 yards down the road we've got the, the old council house and we've got Rope Walk, uh, which is not exactly very beautiful in terms of buildings fronting onto those roads. So I'm not overly uh, bothered about that. It is what it is. But, but, and there's always a but, I suppose, I will not be supporting this uh, application. And I'll, I'll do it for a couple of reasons. One is, I am appalled that the, the applicants have argued uh, viability to avoid paying any sort of 106 and monies to it. I don't believe that is, I, I, I heard what the officer said and I don't believe it. Um, you don't put up this sort of property, whether it's to a high spec or to a low spec or a medium spec, <coughs> Uh, without uh, having profit built into that, and there must be something that could be, even if it was on a limited or reduced basis, there should be some contribution to the residents of this borough. Whatever form that takes, be it the hospital, uh, GPs, anything, play and open space, anything, but to say nothing, there is nothing in that, this development, for a Section 106 uh, agreement, I find that appalling, I find it very disappointing, and I just don't believe it. 
Secondly, what I do find really, really abysmal is there's no affordable uh, development or development flats within this development. Quite frankly, this development is designed for people who have access to money. It is not designed for people like me or people on low incomes that can access that. There are a lot of people who would love to access this sort of thing, but they're not going to be able to because it's only aimed at those people that have money or have some sort of asset that they can sell in order to move into a place like this. That, I'm sorry, but that offends my sensibilities. It offends my principles. And I will not, I will not go down the route. I know they're not planning arguments, but in all conscience, I will not support anything that, is, is, that does not give access to everybody in this borough, uh, irrespective of, uh, of their, their, their positions in life. Uh, and it's just a select argument that, that, or select policy that this company has gone down, uh, and it's just aimed at a particular set of people the people that have money or assets in order to buy it. I'm not going to support that. Uh, that offends me greatly. Uh, and I'm sorry, but that's the situation. Uh, they better think again, as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't know if it's going to go through or not, but it's not going to go through my, my, with my vote. Councillor Pomfret. Councillor Longman says... Um, yeah. But to do with the size of the building itself and whether it's appropriate in that position in the town centre, well, the town centres generally, including our own, do, do include quite a lot of tall buildings. Warwick House is not far away, that's also largely residential now, and I think that's about the same height. Uh, I've got some concerns about um, it being next to the Memorial Gardens, not so much from um, perhaps um, a general point of view, although I don't... But from the, the residents' point of view, because uh, the boundary treatments, uh, I've looked carefully in the documentation, it mentions 1.5 metre uh, fence, I think, onto Vicarage Street. But the car park, uh, which faces onto the Memorial Gardens, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the boundary treatment is along there. Um, I know at the moment, as a car park, we have cameras and things on there, and that anybody who wants to cause mischief is... Um, but hopefully deterred from that. But there is a, you know, a ready means of escape into, into the garden. I was just wondering what consideration has been given to that aspect of the application. Thank you, Chair. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'll have a message. Jackie, have you got... Have we... I haven't got the details of the bank Councillor Ian Lloyd. Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because uh, you hear what some of my colleagues say uh, about the, the costings, what should come over, etc. Um, but as has been pointed out um, by the planning officer, um, that uh, all the relevant departments of the county or borough um, have agreed with the, the assessment. Um, so, a difficulty um, uh, refusing it on that. Um, on the, because um, it's talking about viability, um, we're talking about the social um, or affordable housing um, end of it. Yeah, just sticking with it. Um, but again, um, you know, the viability study that's been looked at by those departments um, says the <coughs> Um, I think, um, I forgot the gentleman's name, Reverend Nobolt summed a lot of it up for me, um, and that was bringing people into the town centre. Yeah, we're going to displace some of the car parking, uh, but we're going to bring between 100 150 people, is it? I can't remember now what it's called. Um, permanently into the, into the town centre. Um, because you've got, you know, you've got 25 flats. There's 50 there, two, two people to flat the same. Yeah, oh, yeah. And then you've got 25 two-bed flats. 
um, which is 50 people plus there, so you could between, really, uh, between 100 and 150 people permanently in the town centre uh, with no car movements. Um, so that's why, you know, having uh, a number of cars sitting there, um, not putting in and out the car park yet, it's not being in revenue, but those cars would be displaced uh, to other car parks, which we've heard we have got uh, room. There is a desperate need, um, whether we like it or not, um, for um, elderly um, residents within town centres, um, both rented and um, um, uh, private. Uh, we've got rented accommodation just across the road. Um, you know, there's rented accommodation elsewhere in the town centres. Uh, it's a difficult one, um, but as I said, the viability study that's been put forward, um, I don't feel um, personally that I can refuse it uh, on, uh, against that um, uh, officer's recommendation from, from the other departments. And as I said, it's bringing people into the town centre, uh, which we desperately need. Councillor Copeland. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, a difficult one for me on one thing because on the actual the buildings and the height of them because I was born and lived the first part of my life in a city I don't have a problem like some people I am in but everybody likes what they like or just like what they but height is never a problem to me only my personal life that is quite often I wish I was a bit tougher there you go but buildings, I love the imposing buildings. I just, I just love them. I actually think we should have more of that. So the actual height of that, and actually when you look at the drawings, and I've, I've seen McCarthy and Stone uh, type developments in other towns, cities, when I've been on a holiday somewhere, I've picked up the brochures, I've had a look at them, and yeah, I would love to live in one if I'm perfectly honest, but I can't afford it. I can. Now, I hear what Barry says about the fact that that gives them a problem. Well, it does, but the problem is on planning, we're often given permission for four and five bedroom houses. Now, I can't afford one of them, so that strikes me as a bit the same. So I don't see that as a, a planning thing, but I understand where he's coming from on that, but that's where we are. I like the idea of people living in the town centre. I think that's a, a great idea. And let's be honest about it, uh, probably including myself, now that I'm retired, I've actually got a bit more money than I thought I would have when I'm retired. No, you can't borrow anything, anybody. I've got it. But you have got that bit of spending power. And I'm assuming people that can afford these because they are for people with a bit more money than the average. They've got money to spend in the town centres. So I like that. That's not to say it should be exclusively for them. Of course not. There should be, and this is where I've come to my problem, is there should be affordable developments in the town centre as well for all different types of people. So I do have a massive problem with this one when we come to the 106 because I have looked a little bit many years ago into the McCarthy Stone type thing and they're not cheap. They're not cheap and you have a payment every year and whatever. You don't just buy it and live in it. Or like that. Now I understand that the, the, the upkeep of them and all that sort of thing but they're certainly not cheap and the model I was, I was tempted to ask the question, but I actually thought it might be unfair of uh, the person who spoke on their behalf. But I just wonder, in other towns and cities that have built these, has it been the same argument, the viability one? I'm just not convinced about it. The problem we have is, it goes to somebody else, the land and property officer, and whoever else looks at it, and the viability is looked at, and the figures are done, and we've just got to be, we've just got to take the result of their thinking, if you like. Or, I'm not saying they're not doing it properly, I can't say that, but it just, you know, we've just got to take 
the fact that that report's been put in, it's been looked at, and oh, the can't follow it down as well. That, and that is really how it is. But I'm not really sorry when this development is going to be a hell of a lot of money. And actual fact, when you look at the contributions requested, let's be absolutely honest about it, they're not a lot of money compared with some other contributions that have been requested. So I struggle, and that's the bit that I do struggle with, Chair. It's the only bit. I'm quite happy with McCarthy and Stone coming here and that their type of developments because they are good. There's no question of that. Oh, they are good. And they're to a high standard, they're quality, and I'm, in one sense I'm pleased, like has been said. I was excited about it. But I honestly didn't expect this contribution thing and the viability thing. Now I don't know how I get around that. I'll, I'll finish up by saying a couple of things. Um, one thing that, as a, a council, we've tried our best to do over well many years, really, is to get some town centre living back, living above shops and people in the town. That obviously will create other things, maybe bring the odd pub back in the area and and cafe culture, think you know things like that. This application we got in front of us, the design, good. <coughs> Location, good. The need for it, good. Can't argue about it. However, I picked up on one word that was just used, and it's exclusive. It is exclusive, because as I asked the question to the applicant, is every unit is for sale. That was confirmed. I have to say, I think their business model is wrong. Their business model, according to the, uh, the applicant, <coughs> is flexible. They've done it in other places, that's what was said. It's flexible. <coughs> but it's not flexible here because of the viability. And like Councillor Copeland, I'm not convinced. I don't believe any applicant, and we've had others in the past, have gone through all of their pre-planning process, all of their estimations, and then it waits till it comes to a committee to say, we can't afford to do it if you expect these contributions. There's one particular one that I remember, is they went away, next time they came back, and there was contributions available. No, well, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about one today. Um, and so I do have an issue over viability. I remember in the good old days when we used to go planning summer school, and I can remember somebody there standing in front of us, giving a, doing a lecture, saying, "Do not believe the viability." things unless you have got all the figures in front of you. I've got no reason to doubt what the officers tell us, but I don't have the figures in front of me, even if I'm clever enough to understand them. I have a concern if, and I'm, I can't say for sure because I don't know, but if the same officers or department dealing with the sale of a piece of land are also dealing, or, or negotiating that rather, are also dealing with the viability aspects of something. It seems to me that it all comes under the land and property department. And so I have, I have some concerns over the independence uh, of that. But in regards to the contributions, I don't see why, why we should be refused the, the affordable housing element of it. I can actually see some arguments why we shouldn't have the others. Play in open space, be near to a park, sports development, direct need. The George Elliott Hospital, viability, I've actually got an issue over that which I've already raised 
uh, about whether we should be asking for contributions for agency stuff. To me, agency stuff aren't a sustainable thing, so I'm surprised that officers ask for that. So that, that's something slightly different. Um, but I do see a need for affordable housing, and I'm, I'm not going to repeat it all, but because people have said about it. These are geared up for people that will probably be able to sell their own properties to be able to move in here. Yes, it will free something up, possibly, for first-time buyers in other accommodation. But it excludes, it excludes people that can't afford to buy these properties. Um, I think that... I think that's probably all I've got to say on it. I'm happy to to um, move to the vote and see where we we go on it. The recommendation has been moved and seconded, and that's Councillor Copeland. Chair, I know it's been moved and seconded something. I'm gonna. Can I move an amendment? Uh, it's actually a delight of what you've said because I must have been, probably was, at the same planning summer school and the same uh, lecture that you were at. I don't have the paperwork in front of me or the details in front of me, and no doubt it would have to be in confidential session. But I'm going to move that we defer this application until we have before us a detailed report from the appropriate officers on the viability study thing that was done. Uh, even if we have to have, from my point of view, a special meeting or whatever, because I, I, don't, I don't like holding things up unnecessarily, but I'm going to move that, Chair. I'm happy to second that if you would agree that the appropriate officer accompany those figures. So, yeah, yeah, in effect, yeah, you'd be moving yeah. deferment for uh, an officer from Land and Property uh, to provide to, to come and, and, and speak at the next next t next time this w was to be considered. Yeah. Yeah, Chair, that, that, that's it. That's what I was asking. I'm apologies right. for not being clear. Right. Well, I'll second. The and the well, I'll second that. Does anybody want to speak on that amendment, Councillor Ian Lloyd? Honest, but um, you know, it does pull at your heartstrings, and uh, I think what has just been suggested is very, very appropriate. Why shouldn't we challenge the figures? Um, so, if we can see the figures and the figures stack up, then I'll be fine with it. If the stickers, figures, figures don't stack up, then we've got another ball game, haven't we? Longdon and Wilson, did I miss somebody? No, Councillor Longdon. Whilst it's, it, it sounds a tempting offer, I, I, I disagree, mm. uh, to be honest, because uh, our officer tonight gave us chapter and verse on how they reached their decisions uh, on, on, on the question of viability, and we're not going to get past that because they're not going to make themselves look foolish by saying we got it wrong. So, in fact, when it comes, it'll come in exactly the same format, and we probably won't be any for any any for any further forward, and I, I just it just to me it's just a total and utter uh, horrible thing, and I, I just don't I just want it to go away. I do not like what Mark McCarthy and Stone are doing, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, nothing is going to change my mind on this uh, unless they change their mind and okay. put some affordable. We're speaking housing. about the amendment now, not going well, back to the application. Well, you're not. You've gone back. Thank you, yes, Chair. No. Councillor Wilson. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Thank you, Chair. Um, I understand the reasoning behind it. My concern is I don't know how competent we would be as a committee to make heads or tails of the figures. I would assume that there would be a wide raft of documents, information, statistics, graphs, spreadsheets, whatever, which the officer today has tried to condense into a speech for us to try and put it into terms that uh, the planning committee can look at. As far as I'm aware, that's going into the more the operational side of what a council does, 
and that's something which, as councillors, we should be very wary of actually interfering in the operational side. We can look at the top line fit stuff and everything, but I'm. I, I would like to progress this application, but I don't see how that's going to progress those who have concerns over the viability when oh. I don't see, as Councillor Longdon has said, the officer changing his mind on the evidence he's given. If there was new evidence, maybe I could see an argument for doing so, but I, I don't see how much further it's going to get us, apart from another committee and, and prolonging another committee, when I think people are pretty much made up their views on this by now. Okay, Councillor Tony. Debate today, this afternoon or this evening, from most of the speakers, most of the speakers all accept what the officers, and they have said to us, we yes. believe what the officers are doing is right because I'm going to vote that way. Oh, not far away from me. Because they have done their work, they have looked at everything they've done. They've looked at the planning, they've looked at the cost, they've looked at the, all of the 106, they've looked at the non-affordable houses for the people. Everybody that spoke, 90% uh, uh, of people, have said, yes, we agree with our officers. They have done their own work, and the company have done their own work. They've done all this. Viability studies have all been done, and they've been presented us to today. They've done that, and now we want to adjourn for them to go back to do what they've already done. No. They've already done. The only thing they did, figures on uh, how much it might cost for the lab. But you can't take away Wait. care. What has been said is the um, 106 and the affordable houses. I, I'm not going to say it's a cop out. Somebody who might not want to put the ladder for yes or no. But well, that, that is wrong. We've had all this. Our officers have done their work and they've presented it today to us. And now we're going to have a journey to listen to them all again tell us well, what we've done. Well, Councillor, we'll have an adjournment. Okay, I'll still make a comment okay. about it if I want to. Yeah, you just have. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Uh, the amendment was moved and seconded that we defer the item for the Land and Property Officer to attend uh, the next meeting of this application committee and for members to be provided with the figures and that for that officer to ex be able to explain uh, them to us if necessary. All those in favour of that amendment? And against? The amendment's lost which takes us on to the recommendation as printed, which is to grant planning permission subject to the conditions printed. All those in favour of that? One, two, three, four, five, six. And against? That's approved. <laughs> okay, if we can move up, oh, yeah, yeah, up to item five, please. Page sixty six, five Abbey Street, Nuneaton. Okay, Jackie, if you're ready. Yeah. Five Abbey Street. This is for a full planning application for a change of use from a betting office, which is a sui generous use, to an adult gaming centre, which is also a sui generous use. A sui, re put my teeth in. A sui generous use is one that doesn't fall into any of the specified use classes. The reason why a planning application is required is because sui generis uses do not have any permitted changes. Therefore, any <coughs> use change will require a planning permission. 
On one side of the site is Cloud, which is a vape store, and on the other is a vacant unit which was last used as Pizza Hut. There have been no letters of objection. However, Councillor Jill Shepherd has requested that the application is considered by Planning <coughs> Applications Committee. <coughs> the key issues are as shown on the PowerPoint. In respect of the application use in a town centre, it is a town centre use in terms of national and local guidance and should assist with the vitality of the town centre and it is considered that it will not impact on any other local or town centres. There are no residential properties in close proximity to the site. The Council's environmental health team have no objection to the proposed use. County highways have been consulted as part of the application process and also have no objection. As well as planning approval, the use will also require a licence that will need to be approved by the Council's licensing team. This has just been submitted. The planning team have held discussions with the licensing team in relation to the hours of operation and historical information of potential issues that this type of use may have caused in the past. They have advised that whilst there are no specific licensing hours for oh, sorry, that whilst there are specific licensing hours for betting shops, there are no mandatory conditions attached to an adult gaming centre under the uh, Gambling Act. In relation to historical issues with this type of use, licensing have advised that they have no history of this type of use causing antisocial behaviour, and this is largely due to the self-governing and stringent protocols that this <coughs> type of use requires. The police are automatically consulted on the planning application and again for licensing. They have not made any representations on the planning application and none today on the licensing, although the consultation period for licensing does not expire until the 8th of March. In conclusion, it is considered that the change of use is acceptable and the recommendation is therefore one, one of approval subject to the condition as printed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Harris Kasuji, thank you for your patience. Um, this proposal is for the replacement of an existing uh, licensed gaming premises with another licensed gaming premises. The proposal fully complies with the adopted development plan and the NPPF. And, and the, NPPF. Um, the activity proposes that of an amusement gaming centre uh, consisting of amusement with prize machines known as adult gaming centres or AGCs in the 2005 Gambling Act. This provides for casual amusement and relaxation for a cross-section of adult shoppers and other adult passers-by. Such establishments are commonly found in the heart of hundreds of shopping centres throughout the UK and are not uncommon, even in defined primary shopping frontages. Indeed, many shopping centres have more than one AGC in the town centre on any interest of acknowledged importance. As an acceptable town centre use, AGCs are found in busy locations where there, is, where there is even residential use above or in adjoining properties. In this case, there are no residential occupiers nearby. The use itself is not an inherently noisy activity. There are no adverse impacts on residential occupiers and there is no evidence of any antisocial behaviour being exacerbated by such uses. Although there is no physical development proposed other than the establishment of the principle of the use, uh, the proposed use will have a shop-like appearance with an active window display. Unlike an arcade, which is noisy to attract a passing customers of all ages, there is a statutory obligation to exclude under-18s from AGCs. Uh, the machines are not noisy in operation and the property is already acoustically, acoustically insulated to building rec standards. This includes suspended ceilings and self-closing doors. Amusement with private machines are fruit machines similar to those found in public houses and cafes and is subject to a strict legal code limiting the maximum payout. Um, fixed odds, I should add, that fixed odds betting terminals known as B2 machines, although this is a licensing matter, uh, which are normally found in betting shops and, ca and casinos, are not permitted in AGCs by law. Uh, that's all I have to say really, and respectfully I to request that you approve the application. Thank okay, you thank much. you. If you... Uh, are there any points of clarification? No? Jackie, anything? No. no. Again, to enable debate to take place, can I move 
the recommendation. Is that seconded? Any member? Councillor Shepherd. There are already two entertainment gaming centres in the town centre already. I really don't see the need for another one. I have got concerns. When we've got residents who are struggling to make ends meet, it will be irresponsible for me, I feel, to support the recommendation of put another gaming centre into the town centre. Thank you. No? In that case... Oh, sorry, no. Uh, in that case, we have the recommendation in front of us, which is to grant planning permission subject to the conditions attached. All those in favour of that? And against? That's approved. So if we can go back to item number four, please, page 60. Three, 57 Highfield Road, Nuneaton. This application is to consider amending the legal agreement signed under approval reference 034184. The legal agreement was for the provision of five one-bedroom flats in line with local guidance and the proposal before you is to amend this to a commuted sum off-site. The previous appro approval was for the erection of 14 apartments and four houses at 57 Highfield Road, approved in 2017. The application is before you because the new proposal is not in accordance with the standard tariff of affordable provision. And in addition, Councillor Condacore has also requested that the application is considered by members. The scheme has now been constructed, but the developer has found that the scheme would not be financially viable if five of the dwellings have to be affordable. In this situation, a viability assessment has been requested and received and scrutinised by the Council's Principal Land and Property Officer. Our Land and Property Officer have carried out a review and analysis of the financial appraisal and also run their own appraisal and residual valuation check. Land and Property's response to the planning team is... Gross sales revenue for the private market element is in line with the market for this type of property in this location. In undertaking our assessment, I've assumed the sales to a registered social landlord or retention of the affordable housing element and attributed a capital value at 80% of the market value, not the 70% or nil value in the applicant's appraisal. Bill costs are lower than expected in the market and this leanness may reflect the type of developer's contract. Professional fees on build, marketing and disposal all appear lower than would normally be expected. It is considered the viability appraisal appear to understate build costs and fees, and these are based on the actual costs given the development is nearing completion. For this type of development, it is normal to see a minimum profit level of 20%, in line with market expectations. The applicant's appraisal showed a return of 12-13%, to 13%, undertaking our own viability appraisal, including the affordable housing element, shows a profit level of only 14%. The residual value of the site is also coming in at less than the benchmark site value and the fee paid for the land. If an appraisal is run assuming the development is all private market housing, then the profit level rises to nearly 16% to 19 which is still well below market expectations. Considering that the presence of an affordable housing element in the block would have a depressing effect on the capital value of the private market element, this would reduce the viability. His final point is that carrying out the analysis, it is concluded that even if a registered social landlord can be found and the developer offer the maximum affordable housing, then the scheme will still be unviable. Additionally, 
the affected value will further compound the unviability. In conclusion, our assessor established that the original scheme with the affordable housing element cannot viably provide the level of affordable housing given the sales rates, development costs and level of return required. A scheme without any affordable housing struggles to deliver a return close to that which a developer would need to achieve to make the scheme viable. Fundamentally, what he's actually saying is that the developer has actually undervalued their costs than what would be expected in current market conditions. Notwithstanding our findings, the developer has actually offered to pay an off-site provision of £20,000. Discussions have been carried out with, the housing, with housing who are disappointed not to receive the affordable units on the site, but who can use the £20,000 towards the acquisition of a dwelling to provide an affordable unit off-site, and they are confident that this can be found within the Attleborough, Abbey or Wembrook wards. The developer has agreed that the payment can be considered within these wards. Therefore, as it is evidence that the site is not commercially viable, it would be dif difficult to, sort, sorry, to support refusal on this basis. Whilst the viability assessment concludes that we should not be asking for any contributions, the developer has offered a commuted sum, which in the circumstances <coughs> is considered acceptable, and the legal recommendation is therefore one of approval to amend the legal agreement to a commuted sum of £20,000 in lieu of the on-site provision. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. To enable debate to take place, can I move the recommendation? Is that seconded? Seconded. Any member? Councillor Shepherd. Oh. Councillor... I've got real concerns with the lack of the affordable houses now being offered to us. We approved this development on getting five units. We're suddenly told, no, we can't afford to give you any. So I've got real concern. I've got concern over the viability assessment, as in the site three we've just looked at. Um, and I've got real concerns that we're opening the door to developers coming back to us and saying, well, we can't give you these five we've promised. So I, I've looked, I've voted on this development previously on having five affordable units and I really can't agree with going for a commuted sum. Previous speaker, you know, but there's one thing about it. Uh, they have, they seem to, we ain't had so many come and tell us they can't afford it over the period of time. Over the years we have had one or two, but uh, we've got a couple of today. Uh, I agree with uh, Gela, the fact is that once you've had five, then you've got to lose them and end up. But there's one thing these people are trying to do, at least they got, they're not totally walking away. Uh, they're putting 20 in housing, uh, housing our, our housing department said, yes, we can do that, put it in that ward. At least there's something there. Again, affordable housing taking it knock and that. But uh, the only thing I'll go down, I, I, I feel, but at least they put 20,000 on. Uh, because you, you say you can't afford it, you got one over there we just blowing past. They got who could afford it, and we just give them permission. It's called democracy, Council of London. Yes, that's what you call it. The it, all the reasons that I spoke about before on the previous one apply. Anybody would think, listening to this assessment on the viability would think that if affordable housing was actually sold, the developer would sell it f uh, uh, and make a loss. And they wouldn't. They'd still make a profit. It wouldn't be so much profit. And if they're rented, people um, are paying rent. So there's income coming in on that. And this viability... We perhaps should have some training on this viability chair at some point because I'm not buying into this quite honest. Perhaps if they didn't spend so much on green paint, they might be able to afford things. Green paint, because that really annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I drive past it to come to the town hall. Um, and these type of applications annoy me too, because I think if you've given an undertaking to do something, you've signed a legal agreement, there has been offer and consideration, you have made 
a pact with the council, a legal agreement to do so. And it will be interesting to know off the officers whether, as part of this viability assessment, the assessment was five against nothing, or whether you've looked at the scale in between and say, well, could we do four, could we do three, could we do two, could we do one? But I feel that even so, personally, I feel I have to be consistent between the applications. And I've taken the word of the, the professional word of the officers on the previous one, so I have to do so. But what also concerns me in this application is that if I don't, and they appeal uh, the decision not to veil the legal agreement, there could be the potential we wouldn't get the £20,000 at all if it went to the inspector. That's, to an extent it has us over a barrel, um, we get none, we get nothing at all, or we get £20,000 and like it and lump it basically, that's the options in front of us tonight I suppose. And at least with the application in front of us, we get and are, should be, touch wood, guaranteed that £20,000 in lieu of the affordable housing. That at least will go some way, not the whole way, to doing something about affordable housing, but it's better than nothing. But I don't like these applications, Chair. And yet again, we're having to do what we don't like on this committee, but that's the nature of the business. That's, hang on a minute. Sorry. Is it if you want them. Sorry about that. Um, in relation to the, um, that they've given an undertaking to provide certain amount of affordable housing, there is provision within the NPPF that says that if viability becomes an issue, that developers have the right to come back to us to renegotiate the terms of their 106 agreement. So they are allowed to do that. Any developer is allowed to do that um, during the course of their, their development. So that's not um, an, an issue, really. Um, secondly, when it comes to the scaling in terms of the numbers of affordable housing that was actually considered as part of this, the assessment that originally came in said they couldn't provide any affordable housing. That assessment was assessed by our land and property team and their conclusions were that they can't even afford, really, to give us the £20,000 commuted sum. So we couldn't even consider whether they could provide us one, two, three or four or a proportion of those affordable units because the conclusion is the £20,000 is a goodwill gesture but actually knocks further on the viability of the scheme and takes it even further away from the realms of affordability. So... We haven't considered any other units because at that time it was considered that even that providing nothing was uh, far too f away from being affordable. Can I say in, Lloyd? Uh, yeah, I mean everything that Councillor Wilson says is true. Uh, I can't, I can't knock it. But um, what concerns me at the end of the day, is we are building more houses, not just in the Neaton and Bedworth, but across the country. And as those houses get built, then people are putting the applications in, they put the viability of them, um, and that comes in, and as they get built, then the market gets a little bit more challenging, so the prices get cheaper, and only more we're going to have coming back, where they've said in the onset that um, they can afford to do four, five, six houses uh, for affordable. And then as the market goes, the, the value of properties go down because more are being built, there's more choice out there, um, then we're going to be in this boat time and time <coughs> again. Um, I just think um, our officers that are you know, looking at these viability studies are uh, going to be, I was going to swear then, a lot hotter. Um, <laughs> than normal, because we're going to have these applications coming back time and time again. I can see it now. Councillor Longdon. Of the 20 grand, that's £4,000 per house. Somebody tell me that they're not going to get that back uh, when they sell them, because I don't believe that they won't. So the, I, I don't believe that the 20 grand is going to cause any major hiccups to them and make it more wobbly or make it uh, less viable. It's just, 
it's just annoying me now, Chair, so I'll shut up because I'll, I'll probably say something I'll get done for. Two questions, now I'll move on to the vote. First question is, and uh, so what is the difference then between the benefits to us of the £20,000 that's been offered and the benefits that five affordable units would have provided? I don't think you could answer it. Well. <laughs> it's on the lines of Council of London. Um, just remind me, well, and others for that matter, uh, because it's referenced on the agenda about the, the original application, what was the officer recommendation to that, including the issue about affordability? Uh, this application didn't actually come to planning committee. It was dealt with under delegated authority. Um, so the, the, the officer recommendation was the decision that was taken. We didn't receive but enough letters of objection or a call for it to come to planning committee, um, so it was dealt with under delegated authority. But to be clear, it included the it affordab include it included the affordability. Yes. Thank you. Okay, the uh, recommendation's been moved and seconded, and that is that we vary the legal agreement as printed. All those in favour of that? And against? And abstentions? So the officer's recommendation has not been approved. So can you, I'm waiting for somebody to move something else. Otherwise we haven't got anything. Councillor Longdon. Yeah, but the, I would move rejection on the grounds that uh, I don't, I, we, it's not been proved that the actual initial agreement is in fact unviable. And the fact they're not here tonight doesn't make doesn't doesn't Definitely. help them. Well, I think much, there's are. people. Yeah. So. Would you like me to comment on the suggested reason that would be? Is that seconded? Seconded. Okay. Before I go into any debate, you did want to say something, Claire? Yeah. yeah. Um, just to advise members, I would be concerned about refusing an application on the um, that it's not being proven that the scheme is, is unviable. A viability assessment has been submitted. The developer is an independent developer not associated with the council. The council's land and property team have assessed that viability and agree with the developer in accordance with that viability assessment that the scheme is not viable to provide that affordable housing element. So I would have strong concerns about refusing an application on those grounds. Okay, so then the next question is then, on the, I'm being careful that we shouldn't just be looking again at the original one, um, but because it was done under delegation, I'm assuming the same thing applied and that uh, land and property people were consulted on it. There was no viability assessment submitted with that application because the five units of affordable housing were in compliance with policy. That's what we requested, that what was, was agreed to be provided. They did not need to assess viability in that instance. Okay, I understand that. Councillor Wilson. The words appeal and unreasonable are flashing in my head at the moment. Um, but let, can I just ask a uh, question of the officers? Let's take the hypothetical situation, which I don't think will happen, that they won't appeal. How do we enforce trying to get five affordable dwellings when they've told us they can't do it? So we've effectively turned around we want those five dwellings. They're saying we can't give them. What are you going to do as an officer to try and enforce it? legal agreement because it's not via a condition 
So we would have to look at how we could enforce the exact wording of that legal agreement. And it, it depends very much on the, the exact terms as to how we could enforce that. Whether it's that they need to be given over at a certain time and they haven't been, therefore, I, I, if Wendy may correct me, it might actually be a, a problem in terms of some sort of prosecution. Am I correct, Wendy? It's very likely that it will be a problem because the way of enforcing a legal agreement is through the court. And as you'll be well aware, the court will take a reasonable approach and look at all the circumstances. I think it's an interesting scenario, <laughs> I mean, it is, and I mean, it is different to the, the previous one. Uh, and bearing in mind that, you know, within our report, um, it, it says that, you know, we applied our policy, which is what we should do. We applied our policy in regard to the afford affordable element, but also the legal agreement was signed between the two parties. And, and, well, we're, we're where we are now. Somebody wants to unsign the agreement. Um, any other member on the... I'm not, I've got to try and get the wording right for this. Can I say something? I'm sorry, you can't. No, it's OK. Oh. Um, right, I need the proper wording for the um, recommendation of refusal. Uh, you might have to help me out, Barry, on this again. It was not proven. It was not proven the initial agreement. What? You can explain. You've done most of it yourself. The fact is, I that think they, that they did believe that it was viable when they signed the, the legal agreement. Okay. Right. Now, now they changed their mind. Yep. But if we changed well, our mind, we, we yep. wouldn't be able to do it because it'd be, it'll be a legally binding agreement. Okay. And I think that we, sh we, we should be able to challenge these things, otherwise we're going to get other, other people coming back, as has been said. Okay. If they like it, they'll come back and keep banging away at I, it. I, I just want to, uh, and that is, the recommendation was for refusal uh, because it is not proven the initial agreement was un unviable. Yes? Yeah. And that was seconded by Councillor Shepherd. You're happy with that confirmation of that wording? I am. I also am. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Hey, you can, yeah. can, can you put your mic and then I might hear? I'm obviously can be defended, obviously. Um, in regard to the loss of the five affordable units in regard to our own policy that has been signed. So can that be, obviously, worded better than myself, I'm sure. Claire? OK, in terms of whether we could defend it on appeal, in terms of the original suggestion that it's not been adequately proven that the original agreement is unviable, I personally don't think we could stand a chance of defending that on appeal. They've submitted a viability assessment that says it's not viable and we have agreed it independently. So I think that we would be in a very difficult position to deal with that. In relation to the affordable housing and the potential impact that that might have on our policy as a borough, um, whilst it is disappointing... They are providing us with a sum of money to go towards the uh, um, acquisition of one other unit. So yes, we are losing units, but the developer is trying to do something to help mitigate that. It's not in accordance with our standard policy, but as set out in the MPPF, viability is something that officers and members have to consider when they're taking regard of decisions on planning applications and they are allowed to challenge um, and revisit agreed section 106s as set out in the um, NPPF where market circumstances mean that there are issues to the afford affordability and deliverability. I do not think that we would be able to adequately defend either reason for refusal on appeal.
Put the water to well, well, put, uh, put of water. It means going down the route that's just been suggested that there's absolutely no point in anybody ever signing no. a legal agreement again. Yeah, I, I, look. because uh, we're setting one hell of a precedent. Because if people can change legal agreements on a whim, I don't know if it's actually fact yeah. or not, because it's not been proven. But if people can do that, there's absolutely no point in having ever having a legal agreement with anybody ever again. There's no point into it. it yeah. that's that's the principle. I think we have to we have to bear in mind as well. Yeah. However, we do have to take note. Of, uh, of what the officers tell us whether or not we agree with them <coughs> is something else and um, all I say like I say on many occasions well I'll say it after uh, is if it went to an appeal and the officers say they can't defend it be prepared to go there to defend it as a councillor on this committee uh, I'm going to unless it's something really different and new and I think it was a question to the officers okay the ballpark figure for cost which would be awarded for us on an application mm -hmm. of this scale if we were held to be unreasonable? The developer would have to produce a viability assessment, instruct an agent to act on their behalf and the costs are based upon the time taken to prepare all of the documents and attend the appeal on an unreasonable decision. So it depends on how much money that particular agent charges on a per hour basis as to what their cost application would be. I couldn't give a ballpark figure in this instance. The bottom line is if we down to what somebody claimed and whether you win or lose and whatever. Um, so we don't know what it, we, we don't know what it is. Um, I'm going to move to the, to the vote on it. It's been moved and seconded. Refusal is that the, uh, the agreement... Was uh, un, un, it wasn't proven that the agreement was unviable. All those in favour of that? Five and against? And I think that's it, in abstentions. That's it. Okay, so that is refused. Uh, that concludes <coughs> the other business, but it does raise one interesting thing. I'll just mention it as an aside under any other items. Is I did take some time to attend the local plan hearing today where the councillor actually said to the planning inspector that the planning application committee nods through everything that the um, officers suggest. Clearly not the case, but there you go. I said that a councillor said to the planning inspector that this committee nods through the recommendations of officers. Can I thank you very much for your attendance and declare the meeting closed?